Hey there, CNC or Scott here again for CNC Labs. We're back with another wonderful tutorial for you guys. If you own one of these or you pay attention to one of these machines, you've probably seen them out there. They have become increasingly popular, especially the customized side of things in the last couple of years. They are money makers. As much as you may not understand what they are or how to play them, people seem to want them, me being one of them. That was one of the reasons I grabbed my machine when I did. It is the illustrious cribbage board. For my board, I wanted to do something that was uh, as unique as you can be in today's day and age. Everything seems to be borrowed or stolen from someone or other. So we came up with this idea of my travels when I lived out west. I wanted, uh, I wanted to do like a 3D topo of my Alberta travels. So I went out from BC and I drove all the way back to Lethbridge and then I fired back down to basically the Canada-US border and the Waterton National Park area. So that was my idea and I'm going to show you guys I'm gonna try and do it as quick as I can because I know I talk too much. Uh, how I kind of grabbed the terrain, which is something we haven't really done in a couple of years. Uh, and then a couple of tips and tricks on how to lay out a cribbage board and how I did it. And um, that's about it. So we're gonna jump over to the tutorial side of things now and I hope you will follow along and learn some fun stuff along the way. Alrighty folks, here we are sitting at the tutorial desk and obviously I have already, which where's up, there we go. I've already carved this guy, you can see that, look at, look at the mountains. They're not really mountains, but they're, they're actually mountains. Before we even get into V-Carve, we are going to go to this Terrain to STL guy. We haven't done any terrain stuff in a couple of years. Andy did a tutorial, I'm gonna say a couple of years ago at least. In order to get this cool looking terrain stuff that we got here, you can pull it from a number of sources. This isn't the only one, but it is very simple to use. The instructions are very clear and I'm not gonna lie, I didn't actually even realize there was instructions. That's how easy it is to use. I didn't even look at that tab. If when I run you through this, you don't understand what I'm saying, there's an instructions tab right there. The aspect ratio I found. So you know what, let's dive in here and I'm like, as far as I know, you can use this anywhere in the world. I obviously have not done it anywhere other than my little chunk of terrain here. I'm going to stick with where I actually was. So we're gonna rip in here to Alberta and the BC border area. I wanted to kind of get, you know, this rectangly guy going. I don't know if it works between provinces and I don't know if it works in any other countries, but if you are using this particular software, website, whatever, uh, and you have, I'm just gonna pop open some of these settings just so you can see, right? The red box is gonna be what we're going to export. If this red box, goes over a border, right? US, Canada, there will, when you export that STL, be a physical line in your model. It's one of the things we're gonna teach you about and how to work around that if you don't notice until after you've imported and started messing with the file. The box scaling factor, you can see, will obviously stretch your box around and mess with that. I think I had mine at four when I was playing. Another fun tip on this one is if you, if you click on any one of the options, and use your arrow key. You can use your arrow key to change the dimension. So my box factor, I'll put it four. My height, I'm gonna scale way down. Again, mistakenly, I did have it too close to the border and I'm gonna show you that workaround after, but for the time being, that's what we're gonna do. So box rotation, I didn't mess with because it skews the box and makes weird stuff, which if that's what you're looking for, knock yourself out. And then vertical scaling is just how much it's going to scale the STL when it exports. Now, I had mine at 1.4, I found gave me a little bit of extra oomph. And even that wasn't quite honestly enough. So that's totally up to you how mountainous you want it to be. Another, another disclaimer was when I did this original one, I started at a vertical scale of 1.1. And when it carved it, it was really weak, if I'm being honest. It, it wasn't like, it didn't look mountainy at all. It looked like just kind of a bunch of little random bumps in it. Um, so then I did 1.4 and then I actually scaled it again inside VCarve a different way than when you import your model. And I'll show you that too. Vertical scaling, 1.4, where was I going with that? Oh, so I carved this at 1.1 and then I didn't like it. And I went, you know what, what I'm, in, I'm instead of grabbing another piece of wood, I've already got the file set up. I know it will work. I just carved right over top of it. So this was my actual tester and then my finish all in the same piece, which was kind of a little nerve wracking because I had everything carved in nice, nice. And then I went, you know what, I'm gonna just basically scrape it all off and carve over top of it. 
it turned out really good. I'm quite pleased with it, with the exception of I went a little bit deep on a couple of the details, but story for another day. You're gonna generate your model. I'm not going to because I have already done this uh, and I've already got one saved. We are going to bounce over into VCarve. Let's start working. This is the width of my document on my, all my document setup. You're gonna have to do it to your specs and what you're using. So again, we are going to Z0 position off the material surface, X, Y's bottom left, and we're gonna hit okay. Go to your modeling tab, import your component. So I'm gonna open that. Document setup size is this little red rectangle up here. He's very small. So I almost always do it just intuitively now. I hit scale because it drops it down to the scale of my piece and then I center it. Cool, it's still too big, that's great. We'll deal with that in just a second. Initial orientation, we don't have to mess with unless it comes in incorrectly. Same thing with the rotation. If it comes in wrong, you can mess around. Scale it down so that it fits my workpiece because right now it is obviously too large. So I believe I made this 14 and then I hit enter. So you can see from a top view that there's a nice little border all the way around. I believe it's about a half an inch. It might be a little bit bigger. Here's that stupid gouge I was telling you about. I'm pleased enough with what this is. Um, so I'm gonna say yes, position and import, wonderful. So we're gonna hit import and we are going to be thrilled with it importing. It's gonna take a little bit longer than a kind of usual one because there's a lot of information here. First things first, let's talk about scaling my Z height. Like I said, I did the first round of this at a 1.1. It was kind of blah looking. So I went, how can I make this better? So I went back and I did it at 1.4 and still went, it just doesn't have enough oomph. I could have went back again and bumped it up even more. There goes the furnace. But instead I came in here and I knew again, I could have imported it and messed with the Z height, but I wanted to show you guys something different. So you can scale the Z height of the model in here. So if you double click on this bouncy looking circle, you can mess with this height in here. So it's telling you that the current height is this, you know, uh, I believe I went to, and again, this is another one of those ones where you can use the arrows. If you click on that guy and you use your arrows, you can use your arrows to move it. I went to 156. I could not tell you why I went to 156. I just did. You can set the exact height if you really want to punch it in. I didn't, I just went with 156 because it seemed to work. So I'm going to hit okay. And now, I don't know if you were able to tell because I've stared at it so much, I can. This has a lot more vertical profile edge to it, which is wonderful. When I had this here yesterday, this guy moved around on me. So I guess my disclaimer is if you're gonna mess with the height, make sure you check your material setup and your, your position, your model position in the material. Again, if you want it to be buried down a little bit, there's nothing wrong with that. It just means you are completely clearing through a layer to give your model inside, give yourself your model inside. That's wonderful. For me, I didn't worry about it because I kind of, I like the thickness of the board and I didn't need to go too crazy. So I buried it at the top and I was good with it. So just pay attention for that if you're gonna go there. Next on the list, I think we'll get rid of this. We'll get rid of that guy and just, yeah, we'll get rid of that guy right now. So typically with a 3D model, you'd grab your thing, you'd get your circular pyramid and you would clicky clicky with the guitar, with the spoon and the Mother's Day stuff, we would go to selected level and we, I mean, there's only one level here, but it would usually say model and you could select it so that it would carve to the extents of the model. Well, we're not gonna do that because of this here. Can't see it from the side too bad. You can see a little, uh, right here, you can see this little gougy looking guy, right? If you go to more of a top view, you'll see why it was kind of bothersome, right? Cause who wants to play cribbage with this big trough here for no freaking reason. I didn't want it. So my, again, I could have went back into trade STL and moved my parameters around to get it. But I said, you know what? I bet you there's a way to fix it in VCarve. And there is. What I want to show you is if you go to draw a rectangle and again, I am going to do it the way I typically do things. So I just draw a shape. hundred percent. Yes. We have now changed the model size by call it an eighth of an inch or so. Zoom in, zoom in, and you can see that we're off by about an eighth where that rectangle is versus the model. So you can grab your model and you can grab your rectangle, which is a little tricky with those guides in place. Click, right? And then again, I because it's not a two-sided carve, there's nothing to line up to. This isn't like a guitar where you're worried about specking it perfect. I said, all right, well, that's where it's supposed to be. So. There's where my rectangle was. Again, you could also just hold down Alt. Ah, you bugger. You could select both. Double click to move it. Hold down Alt and then just drag it by 
basically half the distance is what I did. So it's centered because it's not going to carve this chunk out, right? It's going to char, it's going to charve out. It's going to carve out the rectangle now. So it is a little bit further down, but it's also a little further down here. So the reason we're doing this is if you go into your roughing machine tool path, you can, instead of selecting the model or the model boundary, you can select selected vector right here. And it will now carve to the vector that you have selected. So it's going to ignore that bottom chunk, which is wonderful because it was ugly and I don't want to show it anyways. For this roughing pass, I did use an eighth inch ball nose. You could probably bounce up to a quarter if I'm being totally honest, but I used an eighth because I was, I don't want to say I'm feeling lazy. I, I say that too much on these videos, but I figured an eighth would do me good. It was going through pine, so I wasn't too worried about it. And I let it rip 160, 90, pass depth and 50 was, this was all good the way it was. Again, I can throw these in the description. I was good with that. So we rolled with an eighth. We have our selected vector to go around there. Our boundary offset, because I purposely wanted my model to go right to like this border that I'm creating, I didn't have any um, boundary offset because I didn't want it to go past my model. I want to stay inside there. So I put a zero if you want there to be something. If you want to go right to the edges, if you don't want a border, set yours up a little bit differently, but I did this the way I wanted on purpose. Machining allowance 02 is what it leaves for the, the finishing pass. Roughing strategy, again, at some point I would actually like to go in and do specific testing just to see what these do for myself. Um, I've read about them and there's pros and cons to both. Um, I want to see for myself what it does and then I can maybe report back to you guys. So I left it as is. I do ramp my plunge moves always. Half an inch seems to be good. And then roughing. And 0 0.125 ball nose. That should be good. We're going to hit calculate. It doesn't take too long. And our roughing pass is done. Let's preview that. A quarter inch might not get as much of these details, so it might be faster, but it might make it a little bit harder for, or a little bit longer for the finishing pass. So here's what I was talking about initially, is we're gonna have two bits for the finishing pass. And the reason for, and I did, I didn't actually carve it this way, but I did an experiment where I tested this. If you use just the eighth inch ball nose to do this finishing pass, it looks, really nice. I won't lie. It's, it, it, it turns out pretty good. And for most people, it probably, probably would be good enough. Like you'd probably be like, why would I want to go any further? Well, cause I like to push the limits a little bit. So I wanted to see what the tapered would do with it. The eighth inch finish on its own takes just about an hour, an hour and 15, something like that. The tapered ball nose just on its own was gross. It was like 12 hours for that carve, right? So you're talking, you know, a long freaking time to do just a tapered ball nose. You'll get crazy detail with it, but who wants to let it run for 12 hours? That's kind of foolish. So the way I kind of worked around this was to combine the two. Use the eighth inch ball nose as a, like a clearing finishing pass. So it's almost like a more refined roughing pass that we've already done. We're gonna do three of that. And then the tapered ball nose will get in there and it still takes, I think it was a couple hours for the tapered on its own after using the ball nose as a clearing pass, but you get the best of both worlds. So instead of 12 or 13 hours, you're down to three hours to get the exact same thing. So I'm gonna delete the tapered ball nose for now, just so we can go through this a little bit more easily. So the first round, ball nose. Same settings as before. Step over is at 8% versus 50. So that roughing pass, I wonder if I could just scrap the roughing pass and just do this. You probably could, maybe you could save a step, but I think that roughing pass was pretty quick. I think it's like 15 minutes, we can check. Either way, this is how I did it, and I'm going to show you how to do it. And if you want to bust out the mold, go ahead. 8% instead of 50, it's going to get you a very refined look. It, if I'm being, again, totally honest, I'm not sure that most people would care about taking it to the tapered ball nose level. I did because I really wanted to spec these mountains and have them detailed. We are, again, going to have our model and our vector selected and selected vector so that it will carve out just inside that selected vector and ignore the ugliness. Offset boundary is going to stay put because we don't want to strategy I didn't mess with. And this is going to be now finish. And this is the 0125 ball nose. We're gonna hit calculate. It's gonna take a little bit longer than roughing, but not too terribly long. As you can see, pretty detailed. We're gonna click that off and then we are going to preview and you'll see it go from rough to, again, this is what I'm talking about. For most people, this is probably enough. When I carved that, I went, sweet. I actually didn't even realize that I missed it the first, first time I did it. Um, it looks fantastic. You do get some 
mountainy looking things, you do get some rivery looking things. It's awesome. Let's close this and let's go into our tool set database. In case you haven't ever messed with this, you can get in there there and I think there's another way to get in there too. I can't remember the other way. This is how I do it though. So you go over here to this little guy and you click on it. It brings up all your things. So you have different selections here. If you haven't played in this menu, check it out because there's tons of good stuff in there that a lot of people probably just overlook. You can either just throw it in any old of the ones that are there, click on it, and then this is the one. Add a tool under the selected group, right? I wanted to create a new group when I did this, so I clicked on Imperial Tools and then clicked this guy and it added a group and I was able to name it Tapered Bullnose. So from there, you would click on the this guy and you could do your drop down and you could find the tapered ball nose, which is lovely. It's automatically populating mine. I don't have this up on here, but if you jump over to, and most manufacturers should have this, I'm on our website and I'm gonna to go to our cutting tools and I'm just gonna show you super quick. There's the quarter inch one, there is the eighth inch tapered ball nose, right? So if you, don't, if you click on it, you can come down here and ta-da, you get some specs. People can get confused by this radius one. It happens. So let's bounce over to V-Carve and I'll show you what you're gonna do. Your diameter. It says very clearly what your diameter is. The side angle right here. So if you go again back over in, it'll give you the angle right there, right? 5.177 and when you type that in here, it bounces it up to 5.2 I believe or 5.1 something. Tip radius, this is the big one. Little guy right down here, and we have it listed properly. Where am I going? Right there, right there. It says the radius 0.025, but you have to type in the 0 0.01 inch because that's what the actual tip radius is. So you type that in, ba ba ba, right there. Number flutes uh, doesn't matter, really, and then you can go to your create settings. These are subject to change depending on what type of wood you're running, uh, how aggressive you want to be, things like that. Do -ba -do -ba -do. So I'm going to actually cancel out of this because I don't remember. Oh yeah, that's fine. I don't want to save that. Right. So that's how you do that. Yeah, that, that's how you'd add your taper ball nose. If you have one, if you haven't done it, go to your website, wherever you've ordered it from. If it's us, fantastic. It's there. If it's not us, I hope they have it because it makes life a lot easier. We're going to add our tapered ball nose to really dial in these mountains you'll see. So we'll double click on it. We're going to go to select. I'm going to go to my tapered ball nose. You would have just added it wherever you want. And then we're going to hit 155. These stats are all totally fine by me. It's good to go. We're going to hit select and you'll see that it adds it in there. I still have selected vector. It's still going to do the same thing. Here's where you can really start to mess with your detail. This will affect your time, but it will also give you more detail. I believe I had it down to 0 0.0011 was what I did mine with. And it was again, probably overkill. Most people are going to be like that. I would not wait three hours for. I did. If I change the name of this right now, it is going to change the name of the eighth inch ball nose that we already did. So I'm not going to do that. I will rename it next and you'll see why, because it's going to, now that we've added the second bit, it's going to call the eighth inch ball nose a clear, a clearing pass under the finish and or above the finish and you'll see. So we're going to hit calculate and we'll rename after. So you can see there's a lot of movement going on there. That's okay. And you can also see, this is why I didn't rename it, right? So this is our original eighth inch ball nose, which has now been designated as a clear. And this is actually our tapered ball nose. And if you double click on it, you'll see. Ta-da, see, it highlights the tapered ball nose. So I'm gonna close out and I'm gonna go back here and I'm gonna rename it here. I'm gonna call this three, because that's the order I want it to run, because you kind of need to. And it's gonna be the tapered ball nose. So I'm gonna add that in there. And then I'm going to change this guy and the only reason I'm changing this guy is because I just don't like the one in there. I find it bothersome. Now watch what happens when we go to our preview. Again, this looks really sweet. Scott, why are you wasting your time and everybody else's time to really dial that in? Well, because I want as much detail as I can get and with the tapered ball nose, you really can't get that. So we'll select this and we're gonna go like this and watch. Again, it's not gonna be like a hulking difference, but there is detail that gets dialed right in. Here we go. Ta-da. Some people, again, are going to say that was a waste of time. Why are you doing that? And I'm going to say because now you know how to do it. And now you know how to have two bits in one pass. Right now, we have a really sweet looking topo, but we don't really have a cribbage board. I think it was at this point that I started to really crunch down on my layers a little bit. Right? I wanted things to be sort of organized. And when you start adding hundreds of little circles for peg holes, having them on their own layer to select is whew, a time saver. Here is going to be just that, it's just got the vector or the rectangle outline. 
you can leave it on here. You can rename it. We can call this rectangle, rectangle. There we go, just so we know what it is. Now get my peg holes going and my path, because again, yours is gonna be super different. It could be super different than mine. If you're not doing like something funky and something organic, this could just become a normal cribbage board shape or just a, an outline and that becomes infinitely simpler. I went a little bit off the beaten path and I decided to do something a little bit crazy. So I'm gonna import my bitmap because this is how I traced. See, I took a screen cap of that red box from uh, trained STL. So that is the exact same size as what my model is, right? Once I scale it down, because I did scale it down, if you recall. I'm just gonna go zoop, zoop, zoop. And actually I find I have to go back and then bring it back a little bit. So I'm not worried about like down to the 30 second perfection, but it gives me a pretty close layout of where my path is going to go. You can also see that I now have a bitmap layer. So I'm just gonna turn off the 3D one for now because they seem to fight with each other. And I'm going to select my bitmap. And here's another little fun one. If you right click on it, you can go to object properties and you can change the fading of a non-selected bitmap. I personally don't like it when it's faded because you can't see it. So I turn it right down to zero and now I can see it even when I don't select on it. I don't think I'm gonna waste everybody's time showing you how I drew a squiggly line because I don't think it's all that important. But what I am going to show you, this is my obviously my original file where I knew that this was going to be where I wanted my board to finish. So you'll understand that in a second. So I don't know if you know this, but you can copy between versions of eCarve if you have them open. So I copied those. I'm gonna go back over here and I'm going to paste them. And you can see that it pasted my line and it pasted my finishing. It also brought in my layer, which my vectors layer, I don't want to be way down there. So here's what we're gonna do. We'll show you another, another fun one. If you go to layers tab, you can just grab it and hit the up or down arrow. Ta-da! So I'm gonna move the rectangle up. I'm gonna move the bitmap. These two tend to fight. I'm gonna look into that a little bit more. I haven't looked into it yet, but if you have this guy turned on, it basically, it, like not erases, but it, it overtakes the bitmap layer, even if it's in front of it. I don't like that. So that's why I just turn it off. In Cribbage, if you're not an aficionado like myself, you can choose a two, three, or four lane board. Uh, I'm gonna go with a three laner because in Cribbage you can play solitaire, single. You can play two, which would be against each other. You can play three, which is everybody against each other. Or you can play four, everybody against each other, and teams. I'm going three because it's the best of all worlds. My disclaimer on that and the reason I'm going there is you can see for typical Cribbage boards, they're in blocks of five. It's not set in stone, it's just kind of the traditional way of doing things. Uh, but at the end of each block of five, they have the number listed so that you kind of know where you're going. It makes it easier to count, keep track of things. I do want to have those gaps built into mine, but because I'm doing this weird organic shape, it's gonna get a little weird when we start to offset things. You'll see the inside path, I keep pointing at the screen, the inside path here, the peg holes are closer together than they are on the outside track. Now, there's only so much you can do about that there's gonna come a point where you have to decide aesthetic versus functional and how much you care about both. I tried to balance it and that's basically where we ended up here. I took my driving path and I went down here to my offset and layout. And because I drew this one, uh, if we go into an edit node mode, you can see that it's very, there's very few nodes comparatively speaking to what's gonna happen after we do this offset, right? So we offset, now here is quite possibly the best part of this entire tutorial. Again, I don't know how I came across this, but I'm super thrilled that I did because sometimes Imperial is a pain in the rump. I have always understood why metric is easier, but I still just don't default to it. However, after experimenting and playing around multiple times, I found that 5 16 was the magic number for me for my curbage board and the spacing between the lanes. I couldn't remember what 5 16 was as a decimal. So I did this, right? 5 16 well, it can't interpret that. But, but if you hit equals, watch what happens. As sad as it is, that absolutely made my day when I figured that out or found that out. However I did the other day, it automatically converts a fraction to a decimal. Freaking awesome. It's ridiculously simple, but it made my day. So <laughs> now you know, I'm offsetting in five sixteenths in both directions. We hit offset and we get my offset paths, right? So there's my three lanes from our curvature board. Step one after this, we have to convert these to curves because this is going to be, watch what happens. Look how ugly that is. That is just a lot of extra code for no reason. It's not going to make your life easier. So we're gonna get out of node edit mode, hitting N and we're gonna select both and we're going to 
curve fit to curve. I'm look at that. Bezier curves. My tolerance is very tight. I'm not worried about keeping sharp corners. I am going to replace uh, the selected vectors. And before I do that, actually, I'm going to change this to vectors. I'm going to activate that layer. So I just selected it. I'm right clicking and I'm clicking activate because I want these to be made on the correct layer. So when you hit preview, you'll see that that went from however many hundreds of nodes to now less than hundreds of nodes. I'd like to say we're done with that there, but we are not because like I showed you on that curbage board in that image, the inside path is tighter than the outside path. So you're going to end up with some weirdness. My suggestion was, and again, you can see that my road doesn't didn't follow exactly how far that road went because I was trying to finesse the balance between aesthetic and function and trying to keep those gaps as even as I could. So I'm not going to go through it. I'm not going to tweak, tweak it. So for the rest of the tutorial, it might look a little ugly, but in your case, if you're doing it, you got to pay attention for, oh, you, you could pay attention for that. And when I do offset the, or when I do copy these guys, the, the peg holes, you're going to go, oh, that's what he's talking about. Was another, another thing we haven't used yet. And it is this copy along vectors. Really, really cool. The order of this does matter. So select your paths that you want to copy along. Select your object that you want to be copied along there. And in this case, it is a just over eighth of an inch peg hole. If you put in 0.125 and you're using a 0 0.125 router bit, I believe it can get a little grouchy and say, no dude, that we're not gonna carve that. It's not the right size. That's too, it's too tight. Uh, versus making it 0.126, which is literally just a little bit over. It says, no problem, Aces, we're happy with you. So that's why I did that. You could go in here and you could mess with some of these to smooth them out. And if you right click, you should be able to right click. There you go. If you right click on them, it'll give you options to smooth the points. Um, you can cut, you can delete, you can do whatever you want to do. I can tell you right now, that's going to be hideous and ugly with peg holes coming into it. So I would probably just automatically say, I don't like that. And I would try and smooth this out. So you can hit S and just hover over it and it'll smooth it. And you can see that that's what the smooth does. Yay. Uh, and then again, you may have to mess with this a little bit, but we're going to grab our three lanes and our peg hole. And we're going to go down here to our copy along vectors. In order to figure this out, again, it wasn't rocket science. I went through and I counted the numbers, or you could just divide it because I figured that out afterwards and I laughed at myself. The numbers, the number of numbers that there are equals the number of gaps that you're going to need. So on a typical cribbage board from start to not finish, but start to the end, you have 120 peg holes and one finish hole. So you need 120 plus the gaps. In this particular case, it happens to work out to 24. 120 plus 24 is 144. Align objects to curve, create copies on new layer. I'm not going to do that. Or am I going to do that? I am going to do that. I'm going to actually add my own layer and I'm going to call it peg holes. And I'm going to hit enter and then I'm going to activate this one. So I'm not going to create copies on a new layer. If you want to do it that way and rename it after, you can. And again, you don't have to reverse the direction, but the way my cribbage board is going to play is from Fernie to Waterton. So I wanted to start here because if you don't do this, it starts here and works backwards. It doesn't make a difference. I just wanted to see it go in the direction I wanted it to go. That's why I did that. Copy, and you'll see that it populates all the way along and you are going to see, yay. You can see, as I was showing you earlier, and I'm gonna get rid of my bitmap so you can see what's actually going on that this outside lane looks very nice. They're spaced out. This one's not too bad, but that's not necessarily going to work. However, if we go back to my image here, you'll see that there is not a number for zero, but there is one at the end. So the way I went through, and it was a little bit of a pain in the butt to manually delete these, was I went to the end, there's 120, and then you can count backwards six this way or forwards six this way because there's blocks of five and the sixth one's gonna be the gap. So it's a little tedious. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. And then I know that those are gonna be the same. And you can see for this area, right? Blocks of five, the gap lines up. So one, two, uh, holding shift while I'm selecting these. One, two, three, four, five. Oh, look at that. Six gets rid of that one. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Right, one, two, three, four, five, six, and you see one, two, three, four, five, six. That that is not lined up. So that's where I would have spent some time massaging these areas to try and get it a little closer. But it does eventually start to the you know you get back into a rhythm and it gets back to close. So I'm not going to go through and show you how I did all of that, but that's basically what I did for my peg holes. Once you go through and you're happy with everything, you've massaged it, you've you got your things deleted, 
you can just come up here and you can right click and you can say select layer vectors and you get your peg holes. There are specialty bits out there. So if you're going to be doing a ton of boards, it might be worth grabbing one of those specialty bits. But for my purpose, for the 300 and, you know, something holes that this thing had to go, 360, 370, it survived okay. Drilling tool path. My cut depth of 0.35 worked really nicely. I changed it to 0.25 for one copy, one version, and the pegs were a little wobbly. 0.35 seats them in there nicely. Here is, we're going to use peg drilling. This may or may not be turned on for you. You're gonna turn it on. The retract gap, basically it's going to drill down and then it's gonna just move up just a little tiny bit before it goes back down and up and down and up and down and up and down until it gets to the desired depth of 0.35 or whatever you're typing in there. It's just there to help clear out the stuff that it drills out so it doesn't get all bogged down and start getting crunched in the hole or stuck in the grooves, the flutes of the bit. I did not turn dwell on each one. I did not worry about that, but here is another one of those fun things that we could have used for Mother's Day, but I saved it for here, is project toolpath onto 3D model. So if we would have done this for Mother's Day, where the name kind of faded off with the, the, the contour, it would have helped scribe it there a little better. I wanted to save it for this. I can't overload you guys with all awesomeness in one video, so I saved it. You project your toolpath on the 3D model. That is gonna help these peg holes that are following these paths follow the contours of the train that we're gonna carve. And I'm gonna call this, what is this, four? And I'm gonna call this uh, peg holes, peg holers. And this is a 0.125 bull nose. So we're gonna hit calculate. And you can see that, there we go, it's got a whole bunch of peg holes started. We're gonna get rid of this and we're gonna show you how to preview it. Ta-da! I didn't delete the every sixth one like I did in my, here's my original one, where you can see where I deleted. Ah, right, gap, 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 gap. And some of them line up really nicely, right? That one's not bad, that one's not bad, but this one is a little bit slicey dicey, right? A little bit funky, but if you're doing an organic shape, you're gonna get some weirdness. There's not really an easy way to work around it, so. For the 500th time, that's up to you to decide form over function. Peg holes. Uh, oh yeah, see, this is another fun one that I came up with the other day. I rotated this somewhere along that and I don't remember doing that. So if you want to, because right now if I hold down Alt, right, because I'm going to show you guys, I just, I put those six little holders down here just so you can have your pegs hanging out down there. Hold down Control to copy, hold down Alt to constrain, and it goes where it's supposed to go. See? Hey. Uh, I think I used the spacing tool, the array copy, and there you go. There's my object size. I had two rows and three columns. I put an eighth of an inch gap between everything and I hit copy. There's those guys. You're gonna have to add them to the peg holes tool path. So if you double click on it again, and then just con uh, shift, hold that, hit calculate, and then we can hit preview again. You'll see those six little holes go bloop. Now, wrong spot. I had them tucked down here, but there we go. You don't need to do anything else to it. We do need to have numbers, don't we? So there's those guys, and I'm going to copy them from my previous version, and I'm gonna paste them in here, and there they are. We have our peg holes. We made sure that we projected them. Cool. Same thing's gonna happen with our numbers, which again, I should have put them on a layer. For the love. You've created your numbers. You've placed them where you want them. You're happy with the font and the size. And again, you may wanna do some tests, even just in a scrap piece of wood. Actually, somebody suggested that on, uh, was it the guitar video? Somebody suggested that on the guitar video that, you know, hey, instead of doing a whole body and doing the ferrule holes and some of that stuff, you could just do it in a piece of scrap. 100% right, same thing here. Oh, cause that's on that layer, cause I renamed it. There we go, okay, well there we go. I can select that now. Okay, they're on their own, they're on their own thing. Uh, I did use a V-bit, so you would go to your V-bit. I did choose a starting depth and the way you are going to do that is by turning your map back on and remember this whole scrolling around and checking stuff out. I found what appeared to be the highest point at some way along here, and it was 0.011. You may have to experiment with this a little bit. It's just going to, instead of starting at the top of the piece of wood, it's going to start it down a little bit. And I think I did that just to make up for some of that depth that it carved, because there is a fair amount of elevation change. I did use a flat depth of 0.015 because I didn't want it to keep on burying down there. So for such finicky little numbers, that seemed to work for me. Again, this could be experimental for you guys, depending on your font, depending on the size of your uh, your font that you're using. I did, however, turn my feeds and speeds way down. And I did that because it was so finicky. So this seems really slow, but it was in pine and it was blowing it out. So I had to go slow. 
In hardwood, you could probably get away with a little bit more because you're dealing with a wood that's a little more robust. Again, we're gonna project our tool path onto our 3D model. And that is going to allow it to follow the contours of the terrain that we have carved. Because I did the compass before I did the numbers originally, I'm just gonna follow that same convention. So it was number seven and it was marker numbers 30 degree V bit. And we're gonna hit calculate. And I know that this is messy. I know this is in the wrong spot. I'm not gonna go through. I don't wanna, I don't, these take too long. These videos are, I talk too much anyway. So I'm just, you're gonna pretend that the numbers line up nicely. And we're gonna hit calculate. And then we're going to turn this guy off and we are going to preview and you'll see that it puts it, I mean, obviously again. I could spend the next 20 minutes tweaking this, but you guys don't need to see that. You understand what I'm doing. Um, you can see that it is following the contours though, over here in the mountains, right? It's still carving it. It's following the contour, the terrain, and it's actually engraving them or carving them, which is lovely. From a design standpoint, maybe you want to put like a little box around it so that it is a flat surface and you can see it more easily. That's why this guy's the limits on these things because it's 100% up to you what you want to do. Last, and certainly not least, and I don't want to spend a lot of time on it because it's a total luxury item if you want it. Again, I wanted the compass in there. I wanted something in there because the mountains are over here. Right, this is my original one. The mountains are over here and giving me some visual definition here. The peg holes are coming around here and doing some nice stuff. There's a couple little rivers that show up here. This was kind of a big blank area doing nothing. You could put a name in there. You could put a logo in there. You could put nothing in there. You can do whatever you want. Again, sky's the limit on this. I wanted a compass because I was traveling. It was adventurous. A little, you know, prototypical, but hey, what are you gonna do? So I found a picture of a compass online that I liked. And then to bring it over here, because obviously if you brought the whole compass, it was gonna carve it onto the frame and mess that up. I just went through and trimmed it out with some lines. Nothing too fancy there. We've done that in other tutorials. The profile is just the outline of this guy. And I was absolutely a cheater cheater on this one. And I did use a profile. I, I didn't want to use a V carve because I, again, I, I just, I like the way this works. So for that, again, I had the same starting depth and things like that as the numbers. V-bit settings were the same. I went right on the line because it was basically gonna draw that. It was just gonna trace everything very nicely. I didn't have to give it a, a depth or like a width for the V-bit to go into. I gave it a line to carve on top of. I added ramps to it, clearing parts. You can see that there are certain ones that I wanted it to carve down. I still used a V-bit because it was such fine work that I wasn't gonna be able to get an end mill in there. Everything was the same. It was projected onto the model so that it would follow the detours, the, the detours. <laughs> It would follow the contours of the train, and it does. It actually, you can see where it, it goes up and down. It still carves that depth all the way across, um, but it follows it and it looks lovely. So some of those got carved out and there's little pockets. Uh, I, again, I don't want to go into too much crazy detail about how and why and where for that, because that's a total luxury item. In a nutshell, it's not a super difficult tutorial. There is a ton of really kind of cool little tips and hints that ended up being in this one that I honestly... I didn't plan on usually when we're doing tutorials, I think of, hey, what can I teach you guys that's new or different? That is what I used to create this wonderful piece of art. We went through a bunch of different tips and hints. I hope you found it helpful and handy. We are going to dive over into the, uh, whatchamacallit, the time-lapsing of me carving this beautiful piece of olive into a similar style one of this. It's Live Edge. I think I'm going to leave the Live Edge. And uh, on the other side of all the time-lapse, I will probably have me beating down the only kid who will play garbage with me, and hopefully I can beat him. So stick around for all that fun. Alrighty folks, two cribbage boards, one tutorial. I got two cribbage boards. <laughs> I'm thrilled with how they turned out. Uh, this guy here, the barn board masterpiece, 
I left untreated. It had a cool enough vintage, a cool enough character that I didn't want to add any finish to it. So it's just going to continue to age as it is. The olive wood masterpiece, I am not going to lie. Olive is one of my favorites. I'm thrilled with it. All it got was uh, just like a salad bowl finish, the same as the Mother's Day spoons. Uh, I used a fairly kind of stiffy paintbrush to get into some of these mountainous regions because it wouldn't go on as nicely as you'd like. I'm chuffed. Uh, I hope if nothing else, because these are such a personal thing, uh, you're inspired to go out there and try making one for yourself or a gift for someone else. I know a couple of cribbage board players, middle kid, who would love to have a custom made cribbage, cribbage board for himself. <laughs> uh, they are money makers, so if you're in the business of paying off your machine or you want to, you know, make some side cash, cribbage boards are, even if you've never heard of them and you've never made one, check them out because they are fairly popular, kind of to a crazy point, to be totally honest, for a fairly unknown game. I hope that all the tips and tricks and hints that we showed you in this one, uh, they helped you along, they, they taught you something new. We know that you guys can go anywhere for your information, your tutorials, your products. So we really appreciate that you hang out with us and you, you know, come to us to see what we can give you. Make sure that if you do like what we're doing that you subscribe and you ding the notification bell and all of that social media fun because that's how you stay up to date with all the cool stuff that we're doing. And let me tell you, we have a ton of cool stuff coming up. We hope you enjoyed it. We will see you around the CNC. I gotta take this beast and I gotta go lay a royal beat down on that middle kid that I was telling you about. Stick around for the next one. See you guys.